We ask this question across all our social media. It goes like this. If you were going to offer one piece of practical advice to a new or would-be cruiser, what would it be? Overwhelming response. <laughs> I think this is the biggest response we've ever had to anything we've ever done. Yeah, across um, Facebook, across YouTube, our own FTB, everything. It was... Uh, Really well received. Yeah, and I have to say, actually, I I would say I would agree pretty much with every single piece of one key advice. Yeah, we just given. asked for one. A few went a bit beyond <laughs> one, but yes, I, on the whole, I agreed with them. I have to have to say that. But of course, you have to remember that we were asking people who are doing this, who really know what they're talking about. You know, they're as much experts, if that is a real word, when you apply it to us, as we are. Yeah. So really, this podcast is for people, I guess, who are looking to venture into this lifestyle. Yeah. And so that's why we've done this. We've asked a whole load of experienced people what they would suggest to you before setting off on this venture. Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat, in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go travelling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006 and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube video. And about boats, sailing, travel or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace, Peace and, and fair, fair winds. winds. We had round about 150 comments and pieces of advice from our wonderful people, but we can't read them all. It's just too much. So we're going to pull out the best ones and comment on a few of them. We're going to start off with Tim Lewis, who says it's more wonderful than you can imagine, but more work than you'd expect. Mm. Yep. <laughs> then we've got Sail with the Gales, who say live your own dream because what you see on YouTube is not what you get in reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something we've been saying a lot. Yeah, totally agree with that one. And Greg Brennan says, don't panic. <laughs> and then Jason Jernigan uh, says, just do it. You will figure out what you need along the way. The hardest part is leaving. And uh, that I think the camp's half divided on whether you learn on the way or whether you do your planning and get experience beforehand. We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But I think most crucially, the hardest part is leaving yeah. is something that we cannot emphasise enough because yeah. it's all about that mental leap, isn't it? Yeah, that's the biggest bit. And we've always mm. said that once you've made that mental leap to do it, all the practical stuff should fall into place. If you've got a practical brain, you just work through it. You use books, you online advice, you take all the tests, blah, 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 blah. But the mental leap is the big one. First section we're going to break down is before buying a boat. Lots of advice given on what to think about before you purchase your boat. For example, Paul Doss says, whatever you think it's going to cost, triple it. And she says, however long you think it's going to take, triple it twice. Grant Wing says everything will take twice as long and cost at least double what you expected. Uh, Jeff Andrews says spend at least a year gradually adding expenses to a spreadsheet for your cruising budget until you have thought of every single possible expense, then add another 30%. And Rob Ben, ben Fanati says, my first practical advice is once you have a budget to buy and prepare your boat for the big jump, make a plan to spend only 50% of it. Of course, you won't respect it, but you should be able to leave your first port with that piece of advice. So yeah, all about money, all about how much money. Mm. Well, we can't avoid that, can we? <laughs> uh, but, you know, budgeting for your boat is, is an important consideration. And quite a few people were given advice on not to spend all of your money on the boat, but to hold some back. It's what we did. I mean, when we bought Esper, we knew we were going to have to do various jobs to her. So it depends, you know, on what kind of boat you're going to you're going to buy and what the survey brings up you, you know pretty much immediately what you're going to have to spend money on and of course a bit further down the line so you've got to hold money back for all kinds of things so you need to just find out what your budget is and then use not all of it for the initial purchase yeah i particularly liked um sailing yacht miss fox's advice who said don't buy a boat if you can't afford to pay for it outright mm. borrowing money to acquire a boat is a foolish pursuit <laughs> because it's the maintenance the repairs the upgrades the emergency costs the insurance berthing and provisioning that occupy the true costs of boat ownership not the initial purchase yeah i mean there are companies that will lend you money to buy a boat and people do do that but you've got to be absolutely 
rock solid on your income and know that you're going to be able to afford that mortgage plus all the other things. I liked uh, uh, Lynn Gilbert who says everyone always wants a bigger, better and faster boat. But we all end up in the same beautiful anchorage experiencing the same new adventures. Doesn't matter what boat you're on. Very true. Mm. Well, the, the smaller the boat, the fewer headaches you have in theory. <laughs> Potentially. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to think about there. Uh, now, John B. Gomez said this, and I, I think it's, he's quoting someone else because yeah. I've heard this said many times. In fact, a few people did say it, which was, cruising will cost you everything you have. It's true. The most expensive way to see the world for free. Yes. Yes. It's not free. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> just not free, I'll tell you that right now. You, you have freedom, but it's certainly not free. Um, Simon Boyd adds to what we've just been talking about by saying, yeah, have the money already, have the insurance sorted, don't hope to have others help fund your lifestyle choice. Oh, and enjoy it. I don't know if he's having a crack at YouTube channels. Some of us get sponsorship, some of us um, run ads, and some of us have support through Patreon and FTB mates and things like that. So we don't regard those uh, as crucial to funding our lifestyle. For us, we use that um, that funding to help make these videos. Mm. But don't expect that you're going to be able to make enough money to pay for your boat and fund your lifestyle that way. What do you think of Murray Smith's comment? Uh, work out the boat you can afford and buy one two feet shorter. <laughs> I didn't quite understand that. Is he I, saying it would cost less to run if it's two feet shorter? I, I think really he's just backing up what other people have said, which is don't spend all your money on the boat alone. Mm. Hold some money back. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's debated quite a lot. You know, does the bigger boat cost more money to run? Because... You know, a bigger boat doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have, say, more rigging. It may be that you buy a bigger catamaran rather than a smaller catch. So mm. some costs um, are not the same. They don't go up exponentially. Mm. But certainly things like mooring costs become more expensive. Yeah. The systems can be expensive to repair. When everything's electronic and dooby-dooby, um, to replace it is not only difficult but expensive whereas if you've got something like we have here which is fairly straightforward mechanics you can get most things repaired quite yeah, easily I, I think when you get a bigger boat you're more likely to have say hydraulic systems mm. which are perhaps more more tricky to to repair so maybe that's what he means did you know that liking and subscribing on youtube or wherever you get your podcasts helps us to get noticed go on give us a helping hand We've also got practical buying advice uh, from all our lovely people that commented. And the first one from Sam Dexter is make sure you choose a boat that will do the job you need it to do and be prepared to look at many, many boats before you pick one. And I think that point is often missed. You need to decide what you're going to do in the boat. Are you going to sail around the world? Are you going to be majority of the time a blue water cruiser? Are you going to be sailing in just the area that you buy the boat, for instance, we bought in the Med, we could easily have stayed in the Med. There's lots to see there. We've been over here in Southeast Asia for 12 years and we could do another 12 years here. So what are you going to do? Is it going to be mostly coast coastal cruising? Is it going to be big ocean stuff? And that requires different types of boats. Mm. Or are you just going to sit on the boat drinking G&Ts with friends, you know, one mile from your marina. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a sensible point to make yes. because it does affect the type of boat that uh, that, that you buy. Um, quite a bit of advice as well on learning to sail mm -hmm. on other people's boats, get experience. Uh, and as Landon says, volunteer as crew on a racing boat, uh, preferably a, in a one design fleet, he says. There is no better way to learn the finer points of sailboat handling and sail trim than racing as a member of a regular crew. And I would add to that as well, is getting different experience under different skippers and learning their little tricks. Mm. So things like sail trim, you know, you can mm. pick up one type of sail trim from one skipper and then a different way of managing your sails from another. So mm. uh, it's very good advice. Because there are people who want this lifestyle and they have no experience of sailing. They just think they like the idea. Can't emphasise enough the importance of getting out and doing it beforehand. You may not like it at all. Stephen uh, Desjardins said the same as Anders and then Elegant says do a day skipper course with a great person that's you exactly know. what i did yes i did a day skipper course on esper yes uh for a week and uh well, had, had john on board who was a lovely chap who we got to know previously anyway um and he was a great 
tutor to have on But that board. wasn't before we bought the boat. We'd already bought the boat. Uh, that, that is true. So yes. The advice here is yeah. to do it before you buy the boat. And I, I do tend to agree. I did the competent crew course before I bought the boat. Uh, but you had sailed across the, an ocean in a boat. Mm. So you had a good idea. But if you haven't sailed across an ocean in a boat and got lots of experience, go and do some proper courses in where, whichever country you're from. However, now we did say that the camps roughly split and we've said yes. here in contrast... Uh, Peter Bradley actually just says, just do it, learn on the way, accept all advice and marry it to your needs and take your time. And John Smith says, decide what you want to do with your yacht and go from there. Um, Janet, go on. Yeah, Janet, <laughs> Janet Hughes prioritised function when shopping, i.e. engineer, rigging, steering, seacock, sales, navigation. I think that's really important because so many people look at how pretty the boat is. They look at the colours of <laughs> the upholstery. Um, layout, I think, is slightly different, but it can look great, all of that, but you really do need to make sure where you stand with all the systems. Um, are any of them going to be need, needed to be re, redone? Are you going to have to rip something out, put something new in, is it missing things? Those are maximum important things and no one's mentioned it but I really do believe you should get a, a proper um, surveyor in. Of course, yeah. yeah. By the way, Janet did just add at the end, get a comfortable mattress. <laughs> she did. <laughs> so important. Actually, you know, look when you're looking at boats, remember, think about where you're going to be spending most of your time. As it happens, we spend most of our time in the cockpit. And then the second place we spend most of our time will be in the cabin. And so the cabin was of vital importance to us. And along with that, of course, a decent mattress. Just for balance, we thought we'd throw in a few comments from people who gave their alternative pieces of advice on buying a boat. Uh, John Boardman says, find a friend with a nice new boat that needs crew. And Anthony Ferreira said, take a plane <laughs> <laughs> wherever it is you want to go. Uh, Peter Clark more sensibly says that if you have no technical knowledge or cannot improvise, it's going to be difficult to get on and on with a boat, mm. um, which is a good point. You know, you do have to be honest with yourself. Mm. And hopefully some of these pieces of advice uh, are, are us being honest to you about what you need to consider. Mm. OK, so we've... Well, yes, you didn't say Peter Rollo, better like fixing boats. Oh, OK. Yeah, I think you missed that one out. Well, it, it's kind it's of saying, it's saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, that uh, there is a side to boat ownership which involves being practical. We'll yeah. talk a little bit more about that with some other comments, but it is worth bearing in mind. So, we've bought the boat and uh, we're now about to set off. So, what did we have to think about before setting sail? Yeah, so a few people had some pieces of advice. The wave dancer Westerly Fulmar says, take time to know your boat and how to fix it yourself before casting off forever. You can't call a mechanic or an electrician in the middle of the ocean. You might not have the fund for the ideal boat, but you can work with what you have to start with. So, that's the second bit. But the first bit about getting to know your boat, I could not agree with more. It's something that has come up in the past when we've made comparisons with owning a house versus owning a boat. Um, one of the things that we keep trying to emphasise is that when things go wrong on the boat, you do not have the luxury of being able to call up a professional who can come along in her truck, his truck, with all the right gear and fix your problem for you and throw mm. money at it. You mm. do have to have an element of practicality yourself to mm. at least attempt some of the problems that you are going to have on the boat. So start off with the boat you've bought and go through the system. I mean, do some checks, do some engine checks, do some navigation checks, do check all your systems of your boat thoroughly, do a few practice sails. I think that's what we're saying. Don't mm. just go launch yourself straight out from the middle of the ocean. Yes. Um, co Coley Coley Gel? Co co <laughs> Cole J. Hall, yes. don't know. Sorry about that. Uh, it just says build your confidence in a boat and your own skills. And I, th I think that kind of comes with time anyway. If you've, if you've had the confidence to buy a boat, step on it and take it out to sea, uh, the rest kind of follows. Yeah, when we bought Esper in uh, Eastern Mediterranean, we were sailing all around the Greek islands and all around the co Turkish coast, getting to know her. Making loads of mistakes. Yes. That is part of the process. Sorry for interrupting, but while I've got you here, if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a Patreon, or join us on FTP Mates, or even drop a quid in the rum fund, go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub. Of course, come to the pub. Sailing pal Hannah has some good advice here, who says get an oversized anchor. We will be talking just a little bit more about anchors because it is something people are passionate about. 
Um, get out and anchor in some higher winds to get comfortable on your boat at anchor. Get used to the noises that you'll hear and how the boat acts at anchor. This is extremely good advice because every boat is different. Every boat behaves differently at anchor. Uh, most require the same sort of anchoring techniques, but after that, um, you know, they'll move differently in the winds. And I definitely agree with the sounds. Boats make the weirdest sounds. But you get used to them, don't you? And if, they, if that sound changes, you think, oh, I don't know that sound. Yes. What's that all about? Something's wrong. I need to go investigate. Mm, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so um, don't forget, if you're a cruiser, that you're going to spend most of your time at anchor, unless you're a marina queen. You're going to be on your anchor nearly all of the time. It's absolutely crucial part of cruising, and you have to be thoroughly, thoroughly happy with it. When we first bought Esper, we had a different anchor to the one we have now, and we weren't very good at anchoring. So we went out and we learned how to do it with books and advice and practical experience. And we did eventually get a Rockner. I think everybody knows we've got a Rockner. It's the same one we've had since 2000 and seven or eight I think mm. still so the same one you mentioned advice because Dreamtime Sale says listen to all the advice yes. that you can from people ex from uh, people with experience but don't blindly follow them mm. this is excellent advice yes. and at the point I would the word I would emphasize here is listen to people with experience yeah choose your gatekeepers choose the people you listen to with great care there's an awful lot and I've watched it through <laughs> through the through my hands um some terrible advice out there. Uh, so, yeah, really. They do, they do go on to say they, yep. make, they make mistakes. Yeah. Listen, then do your own research yeah. and make your own decisions based on the best of the mix of the two. I think, you know, this is a really, really good point is yes. to, and we always say this, we say this especially about visiting new places, yep. is to listen to what people have to say to them. But then, you know, just take it on board. Don't follow it blindly. Yes, that's right. I, I do agree with that very much. So it's, it's good advice. Now, Sailing in Faith says something which a couple of people have said, and I, I'm not sure I entirely agree with this, yep. but it's clearly a thing because a few people have mentioned it. And that yep. is the first year of cruising is the worst there will be highs and lows, but don't sell the boat after a low. You'll regret it for the rest of your life. Now, I wouldn't say our first year was our worst year no. of cruising, but I thought a bit more about this. And I have to say, when I think back to our first year of cruising, well, A, we made a ton of mistakes. Yep. And B, when there were problems with the boat, we were running around like headless chickens because we had no experience of fixing broken alternators, for example. We have met people in the last 20 years or so who have done exactly what this person who is it Sailing in Faith says. They've given up after a year because things go wrong. And things go wrong all the time on boats. Mm. It's part of boating. It's part of cruising. It's not just cruising. It's any boats. Um, you have... So that's why it's so crucial to do all the stuff before you get on the boat. Read as much as you can, get as much information, real information. And as Sailing with a Girl says, not just YouTube, who they're trying to sell you a beautiful story. Get real information of what's going on um, on a boat. Yeah. There was a, quite a bit of uh, advice on being cautious of YouTube uh, yeah. videos. And uh, again, I'm just kind of split on that because actually when it comes to specific problems, YouTube is one of the best places to learn yes. about how to fix things. But I think more generally, just take the YouTube videos that you see uh, with a slight pinch of salt and know that your experience may vary. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... Oh, can we just finish, by the way, with Glenn Lumen on that subject, who yeah. just says you can go anywhere or any time, but not both. Yeah, not at the same time. Yes. Definitely not. Um, well, that, yeah, there's more on that later. Um, yeah. Now, we, we mentioned about uh, selling the boat after bad experiences. Now, I've got a great uh, quote here from Stuart McKenzie, um, who says, make sure, absolutely sure, that each and every one who will ultimately be involved in the adventure is equally as keen as the main person. Like many before me, I can testify that eventually it all becomes too much and the dream comes to an end. In our case, it was a mutually agreed decision to stop our life on a boat. Well, sort of. But I'm sure that sometimes it could end up in tears and recriminations. However, giving up on a dream isn't as daunting a prospect as giving up on your life partner. After all, it's only a boat, isn't it? Now, I think Stuart's very brave to actually come up with this comment because Stuart was one person who did this. 
And all credit to him and his partner, Moon, for actually going out there, buying the boat yeah. and giving it a go. I mean, he has went one step further than many people do who think about doing this but never yeah. actually get to it. Yeah. But he was right to identify that at some point uh, in their boat ownership uh, period, they realised that, you know, there wasn't... the they didn't equally love the adventure. There's often one driver, there's one person in the, re in the relationship, they are often couples and families, who wants to has this dream, wants to do it. And quite often what happens is that the other person doesn't have the dream, but it's in varying degrees. They, mm. they either may just not want to do it full stop, so that's the end of it, it's not going to happen. Or they're doing it to please their partner and not thinking about themselves. But when so you're on a boat 24-7 in a tiny little space, that's... That won't last. You can't keep pretending. You have to be honest. So this is a plea to those people who are going along because their partner wants to do it. Be really honest with yourself. If you don't want to do it, you must say now. It will cause so much heartache later down the line. You know, people splitting up, all, all sorts of terrible things happening because the second person in the relationship, the person who's less committed, doesn't tell that first person. Also, the first person who was driving it has got to listen, mm. haven't they? Well, I think Stuart's right to yeah. say, to recognise this and to say, OK, what's more important? Is it my relationship? Because, you know, we have met people who have decided that actually they preferred being on the boat than they were sticking, <laughs> sticking with their partner. Yeah, there is and that. They, they have split up. Yeah. What do you think of Mike Cloutier's comment who <laughs> says, make sure your wife likes the boat? <laughs> Yes, well, I think my wife likes the boat, don't you? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, though it's slightly sexist. You are assuming that it's a male you're talking to. There are plenty of women out there who buy boats. I'm one of them. And uh, there are also people who, who have um, husbands. So, uh, yes. uh, another, another one that uh, I think <laughs> should be taken with a pinch of salt is Vito uh, Chiaravino. I think oh, yeah. his name is. Sorry if I mispronounced that. It takes a year to get used to the lifestyle, especially if you come from a high-stress environment. Yep, fair enough. Women have more difficulty time adjusting. Hmm. Now, maybe this is just spoken from personal experience, but I can tell you I have sailed with many women who were far more competent and adjusted far more quickly than many men I know. So I, I'm, I'm going to contest that bit. Yeah, I would just if you just took that one small bit out, then everything else he says is right. Yeah, because he goes on to say, uh, or she, uh, be patient with your spouse and don't forget to smell the roses. Sometimes people forget to have joy. You have to find joy in everything. Even when things are cocking up, have a joke, find some joy. Look at the sky, look at the birds, I don't know. Yep. Um, Continuing the subject of crew and partners, yes. uh, uh, SV Defino says, make sure your guests understand how much toilet paper to use. Yep. And, and where it goes. And Michelle Goodyear says, and where it goes. That's right. Yeah. I think that's excellent advice. It's excellent, practical, straightforward, simple advice that everyone needs to follow. Well, this is just the basic rule of laying down the law when the crew come on board, you talk through all your systems before you weigh anchor. Yeah. So everyone understands how everything works and what your rules are, because again, every boat is different. Yes. And as long as everyone understands what the skipper is expecting of them. Yes. Um, and when we say crew, by the way, we mean family and yes. we mean friends and guests and paid crew, everybody, anyone yeah. else who's on the boat. Yeah. At this point, I want to throw in perhaps my favourite piece of advice <laughs> uh, of, of all of these is by David uh, Hardwick, who says, choose your partner carefully or know them well, because any size boat is small out there. And I absolutely love that comment. doesn't matter whether you're on a 27 yeah. foot sailboat or a, an 80 foot super yacht out there. When the shit hits the fan, you're all very, very little and you are depending on reliable crew and partners to help you out of those situations. So, as he says, choose them carefully. Yeah, and if you didn't know each other well beforehand, you'll certainly get to know each other well very, very quickly. Julie Hyde comes in and she agrees with that, just says trust each other, don't second guess what each other uh, is expected of each other and have your own experiences and don't let other experiences cloud yours as yes, well. Yes, exactly so. what we said before. We agree yeah. with that, Julie. Barbara Leppen, consider implementing the five-day rule mm. when it comes to visitors on your boat. <laughs> Fish and visitors both stink after three days, says Joe McEwen. <laughs> yes, so no more than five days at a time on a boat unless you're some kind of saint. Mm. 
If you find this topic interesting and would like to continue the conversation, come and join the Follow the Boat Discord community. Look for the link in the description. It's free. The next section we're going to tackle is actually on passage. What kind of advice can all these experienced people give you once we have weighed anchor and got the sails out? <laughs> and I think we'll begin with Sam Gaylard. Hello, who, Sam. Who gives some great advice. And he says, ditch the cruising guide, go explore. Oh, and I think that, controversial. Well, I, I no, I think it's more about the sentiment. It, yes. It's don't stick to rigid rules. The reason why you have your boat is to have freedom to go and explore. And if you do as what all these people have been warning you previously have said, which is, you know, to take people's advice literally, um, kind of takes half the fun out of it. Yes, yeah, so I think from what, the way he's phrased it, he's suggesting he's already got a cruising guide and he's then ditched it so that's how i see it mm. i would say i get a cruising guide because these are properly researched and um they're good books they know what they're talking about we used rod heichel's guide to um turkey a lot and it was very useful once you've got that and you've got it under your belt and you understand it all then you can start breaking the rules and try different things i think that's what he's saying yeah. i think if you've been um cruising for a long, long time, you probably don't even need a cruising guide in the first place. But when yeah. you start out, get cruising guides, use them and then do your own thing. Mm. It's kind of, it's that old adage, isn't it? Learn the rules before you break the yeah, rules. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Sailing Gargoyle's comment I absolutely love. They said, remember, it's always when, not if. So important to bear this in mind. This makes it easier to stay calm when you have run aground, banged a rock, hit a coral head, scraped your shiny gel coat, or totally screwed up a docking manoeuvre in a marina whilst everyone else looks on. Yes, I know exactly what <laughs> you mean there. That has happened on more than one occasion. Pretty much all of those things will happen to everyone over time. And then the other comment, which I love, by Alexander... De Can you pronounce that surname? Uh, Demyanyuk. Sorry, Alexander. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but they say, make a detailed schedule of your trip, print it and pin it to the wall, then burn it. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> you are now free. I love it. So I think there's quite conflicting information and views. You can hold both views at the same time as a word for that, I can't what it is. But basically you do plan, you do schedule, you do navigate, you do all your planning and then you throw it out the window. But you need to have done it. Do you see what I mean? I mean, when we go anywhere, you, we, I've got the bigger picture of where we're going. You tend to do the daily and we, perhaps weekly ideas of where we're going to stop. But you always have second, third and fourth uh, options uh, for everything. Yeah, they're called contingencies. Yes. So, you know, you're aware of every single possibility. And quite often we change our minds when we are on passage and decide, actually, let's not go there. Let's go to this one. This looks better. The subject of schedules generally um, has exercised a lot of people as it does cruisers all over the world. We don't like schedules generally. Um, and if you miss a window, you're out and you've got to change it. So it's really important that you don't stick to timetables. As Brad O'Brien says, never be on a schedule and be prepared to sit for days until the right weather window opens up. No use breaking your boat and scaring the shit out of wifey just to get to a destination on time. Or, and or husbandy or matey. <laughs> I get your drift. I get your drift, Brad. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yes, Simon Moorcroft. Uh, hi, Simon. Uh, says, go slowly. Less is definitely more. So don't feel the need to constantly jump from one place to the next. Oh, I so agree. Now, we're all different. As you know, from watching our videos, we like to take things slowly and a lot more slowly than many other cruisers who we say see whiz through I can think of one person who's almost circumnavigated half of Indonesia <laughs> and has come back round again. Um, and for me, I just say, just slow down. And I think that's a sentiment that is shared by people like Simon. Mary yeah. Chaplin of uh, Sail to the Sunset says, enjoy every day, don't be in a rush. You need to be able to mend your boat or it will be extra expensive and enjoy waking up to new views not seen by a lot of people. And of course, a lot of this comes about from taking it slowly and discovering these new views. Bart Krotik, Krotik says, never sail on a schedule. John Callahan says, lose the watch. Don't be forced into things because of time constraints. And if in doubt, wait. Again, good advice. 
Don't stick to a timetable promising to be at a certain place at a certain time. Adjust your plans to the weather. Karina Hummeland. Yes, absolutely right. And um, what have we got? Carolyn Brown Brownlaw. If you have to, hurry slowly. And finally, Terry Baker. Hi, Terry. My old submarine motto has always, be, has always paid dividends. Festina lente, which means hasten slowly. That's us. We hasten slowly. Well, we don't really hasten at all ever. We just go slowly. <laughs> uh, we do what the wind tells us. When it's right, we go. But we also love the destinations that we visit. And it's for us, that's what it's all about. Why come to Southeast Asia and not spend a long time looking at places that we'll probably never get the chance to see again? The idea of rushing through and missing this place is completely foreign to me. Yeah, we mentioned earlier about um, guests and having rules <laughs> about having guests on. Uh, I don't know where the comment's gone here, but uh, another theme that did come up is not rushing to work a schedule around picking up guests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You um, can't. It happened to us yes. uh, on one particular occasion trying to see an old school friend one Christmas, uh, leaving Phuket, and the winds hadn't changed. They were still southwesterly, and it was an absolutely horrendous trip worst mm. anchorage we'd ever been in just because we were trying to get somewhere to see someone at a specific time mm. but it just happened they were on holiday so that was mm. the only chance we were going to see them but it was a real lesson in not forcing your passage mm. to suit other people yes and if people are coming out to join you you need to you need to be able to have a rough idea of where you'll be and they need to be flexible to find you because as you know sailing anything can happen yeah Okay, a bit of advice yeah, on uh, just some practical advice on passage planning. Uh, Stephen Payne says, when moving around the deck of your boat, one hand for the boat, one hand for you. Always. I think we, we all learn that, don't we, when we start sailing. Uh, Christine Mellett says, keep a track into anchorages so that you can find your way out when all hell breaks loose, usually in the middle of the night. And that's happened a few times. We've had to follow the track out in a whiteout or a blackout at night. You can't see anything and you know that there are yep. big fishing boats bearing down and you've got to get out. Yep. Uh, Ra Valenzuela. <laughs> Valenzuela, I love this. Yes. Move your personal radio chatter to a different channel other than channel 1-6. One of the worst places that we've had that problem is in the Singapore Strait. Can you believe it? One of the busiest shipping lanes in the world with all these professional boats and all chatting to each other on 1-6. Mm. Unreal. Uh, James did. Digitus, <laughs> sorry, James says, get the best, largest dinghy you can afford and stick the biggest two stroke engine on it. At the very, very least, a 9.9 .9 horsepower. We can attest to this. We spent many years with just a little Yamaha Malta 3.2, 3.3 on a very crappy dinghy, and it is quite restricting. Mm. It dictates where you anchor and how far you can travel in your dinghy. And having um, our nice high field with a 9.8 we've got, uh, we can now plane with not too much stuff on, on the dinghy. And it just means that when we come to an anchorage, we don't have to worry about trying to anchor as close to land as possible. I would add to that that you don't want the biggest dinghy you can find. You want the biggest dinghy that you can actually carry, lift to, or to move. To manage, yes. Yeah, because some people go for these super duper dinghies and they can't actually do anything with them. We've seen them, you know, they look very nice, but they're very impractical, difficult to get onto the boat, difficult to get up the beach. Um, so do think about that. And it's the same with the engine, with the motor. Yeah. James Patton says, it's not comfortable to check your <laughs> phone on the toilet while underway. Uh, if any of you have felt slightly seasick looking at your phone in a car, it's the same thing. Concentrate on the job at hand, mm. is my advice. Mm. Certainly when Pun you're intended. Yes. Maddie Sock B says, have paper chart backups to know how to sail and navigate without a motor or electronics in case everything or anything goes tits up. I think this is generally good advice for anyone buying a boat is that we have the luxury of... Uh, technology. We talked a bit about this in our previous podcast on apps, but it is absolutely vital that you understand how to read and use paper charts because there can be occasions when all your systems goes down and you will be dependent upon uh, paper charts and compasses, dividers, that kind of thing. So know how to use them. Mm. Timothy Breeding, use the radar at night and keep away from random fishing boats. Yes. Good, solid advice. Um, and Kelly Turpin, have a water maker. I would agree with that. Yes. I'm just sorry. I'm just reading the comments here, and I can see that uh, iJazz also a uh, jazz 
4995, sorry, says be prepared to operate in a pre Starlink state. So this is just goes back to what I was saying about don't depend on your technology. Yes, I mean, that is what Maddie's Hot Bee was saying. And then finally, Salty Lass <laughs> in this section says, always ask the locals. They know the tides, the rocks, the hidden hazards, etc. Local knowledge, you yeah, can't beat can't it. can't beat it. Okay, let's just quickly look at boat maintenance. More great advice here. Don Suter says, be prepared to learn a lot. Electrical, plumbing and, and uh, mechanical, that kind of thing. Or be prepared to spend a lot on mechanics, mm, yeah. which is fine, as we said earlier, when you can. But uh, there will be occasions when you can't. Yes. And Tony, aware that if you don't like pottering and tinkering, then it's not for you. There's always a job to do. And no matter how small a job, it will inevitably turn into a much larger job. That is a cruiser speaking <laughs> from experience. And there are loads and loads of people talking about maintenance. And with the best one in the world, I don't think we can really read them all out, can we? Yeah. I mean, the, the underlying rule here is that there is masses of maintenance. It does happen almost daily and you need to be on top of it and you need to be prepared to do it. And as we may have seen from a number of YouTube channels at the moment, getting new boats built, as oh, yes. Du De Burr says, unlike a house, boats move all the time, so stuff breaks and he adds, or they add, doesn't matter if it's old or new. Yeah, interesting that. There's a uh, I don't know how many channels people here watch, but there are three big channels with new boats and they've had horrendous problems. So, you know, sometimes a boat that's not that old but has been used and is um, going along nicely might be a better buy. I don't know. Mm. Up for discussion. I just wanted to just finish off this section mm. on maintenance, uh, taking advice from Anita Farine, who says, learn discernment. You will be surrounded by people that give you advice of which most is good. Learn from those experienced people. And, you know, Mark Z and Blaine Stevenson all say something similar in that there's lots of good advice out there. Take it on board, but choose who you take your advice from. And sometimes the person who's sitting at anchor next to you is going to be in a much better place to help you out yes. than someone sitting behind their keyboard on the internet. Yes, yes. Although that person on the internet can also be <laughs> very helpful as well. Yeah. Take your information from many sources. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, loads and loads and loads and loads. Have a good selection of O-rings, says S.V. Umenko. Kiss method always wins, Craig Barrett. Um, before having any boat work done by so-called professionals, do your homework and find out the quality issues, how it should be done properly and what pro properly means. So, you know, the onus is on you, I think, that cruisers are saying. It's on us, ourselves, to know what we're doing and to get it done properly. Let's just quickly talk about weather because quite a few of you out there had some good advice on weather. And of course, it's a massive part of, you know, the sailing lifestyle. Gavin Halls just says, learn how to read the skies and weather forecasts because ultimately these are what will help you uh, choose the best anchorages at night and to keep you comfortable. Stacey Hoops, understand that Mother Nature can be your best ally and your worst enemy. Know her as intimately as you can, and uh, you sure get intimate with the weather on a boat. Yeah. Stephen Guitar says, don't be impatient with the weather and tides. They will win the argument. This is basically just saying, choose, choose your weather windows. Choose your anchorages according to the weather forecast of up and coming uh, weather. This is a good example, this new location we're in now. We know the winds are set from a certain distance. And even though we're completely open to the north and the uh, the northeast out there, uh, we know that, um, well, according to the forecast, <laughs> uh, things will remain nice and calm and flat. And that goes on to what Daniel Stokesbury says, which is keep a keen eye on the forecast. These days, misery is optional. And to a certain extent, it's true. There are so many great apps and ways of discovering what's going on out there that uh, you should be reasonably OK. Can we, <laughs> can we go on to a controversial <laughs> one? Here An we go. Anchors. Anchors. We all <laughs> love discussing anchors. And if you don't own a boat and you don't know uh, about uh, the sort of thing that we talk about in the bar when we have our sundowners, anchors. Anchors and toilets, they come up every time. <laughs> Ian Paul says, never discuss the merits of one anchor over another. It ranks up there with religion and politics. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Salty Lass says, always discuss the merits of one anchor <laughs> over another. It allows you to point out why yours is better than theirs. And so it goes, and that is the way it will go forever. <laughs> um, 
I mean, Troy Roosh says, don't skimp on the anchor. I mean, your ground tackle, your anchor, uh, the chain, the windlass, all of this kind of thing, you're going to be depending on it so much. And it is up there as probably more important than your sails, I would say. Yes. They're, don't ask the question, as I did as a newbie, what's the best anchor I should buy? I did that on a forum and it went ballistic. Um, you can, there are plenty of places where you can discover, you know, about different anchors and there isn't one that best anchor. I said before we have a rockner, but that's just what we've got. There are other anchors on other boats. Um, I like um, Bill Sowers. In sketchy harbours, keep an anchor watch. If solo, take a bearing before sleep and check every hour. Good coffee. Yes, sometimes you have to anchor somewhere you wouldn't choose to. Or you may be somewhere where you chose to, but the weather's changed and it's pretty bad. And you have to take anchor watch. We took anchor watch for nearly two days when we were up in Kudat. Do you like our coffee mugs? You can get your own from our shop. Find them at followtheboat.com forward slash shop. So you've done your planning, you've bought your boat, you've gone on passage and we've just discussed anchors. So you've dropped the hook and you're now in a new location. So we have a couple of bits of advice on discovering new cultures. Great Far Lake Sea yep. says, try to be open to foods the locals eat. Go to local markets ask what different fruits and vegetables are, how to prepare them, etc. Trying to stay with the diet you grew up with while cruising ends up being an expensive and disappointing act of frustration. Yes, we now cook things daily and have as a regular part of our diet that we wouldn't dream of having back in the UK. So yeah, do it. And it's fun. If you're into cookery at all, it's fun discovering all these new recipes. Yeah, and... You know, we the times when we try and find foods that we're used to, things like cheese <laughs> over here can be quite difficult to find. And it's the same for meat eaters, especially uh, in these Muslim countries trying to find pork, for example, can be done. But I think if you become obsessed and just cannot live without these food types that you're so used to at home, you could be in for a disappointment. So mm. just basically learn to adjust your diet. Learn to love fish. Uh, John B. Gomez says, when you are a visitor while in another country, please act accordingly. Mm. And Cecile Murray says, learn a language. And this is so important. You know, we agree with this. It's even the basics make a huge difference in uh, them being, you know, accepting of you. So just a hello and a please and where is left and right numbers, basic things like that. It yeah, makes we, a huge difference. Yes, we always learn thank you and numbers in, mm. every, in every language. Okay, so wonderful bits of advice there. Um, we thank everyone for contributing to, to this. I think perhaps we should just finish off with some miscellaneous boating <laughs> philosophy. Uh, okay, sailing aquamarine, don't procrastinate, JFDI. You know what JFDI means, don't you? Yes. Uh, Brendan, our good old friend Brendan, says, follow your heart and use your newfound love, i.e. your boat, to be free. These vessels were designed for freedom. Couldn't Ter agree more yes, with that. absolutely. Terry Baker, expect nothing and be pleasantly surprised. And uh, our friend, our dear friend Helene, she says something similar to Brendan, which is open your heart to the be here now moments. The good, the not so good, the amazing, the astounding. Boat maintenance, occasional fear and anxiety are well worth all of the above. Totally agree with Helene, sensible lady. Um, and I suppose we should finish with the famous quote of all time, the Lynn and Larry party. Or do you have something else you want to say? Uh, no, <laughs> part, I just want to say Peter Westall's one is a great one. Go on. Shit happens, <laughs> even to nice people. Yes, because Sometimes things go a little bit wonky on boats and you've just got to be prepared for them. But yes, I guess we should finish with Lynn and Larry's famous quote. Go small, go simple, or go now. Uh, I think it still stands. I think it's true. I think simplicity is key quite a lot of the time. People overcomplicate things. We've got lots of new technology, which is great, but just keep it simple. But, uh, but more importantly, just go now. Go now. Do it now. Don't wait any longer just do it if you're going to do it do it stop talking about it do it <laughs> oh of course there was one piece of advice oh yes that had never crossed my mind before from Dol uh, Dol Benton's bat <laughs> some of these names never sail with a goat on board they are greedy and bad with knots that's a good point <laughs> I mean you can't fault that statement can you 
And we love goats. I love goats. But would you have one on board? No, mm. because they can't tie knots and they eat everything in sight. 